Okay, looks like we're recording. So I'm just going to turn this over to Joni and Jill and let you introduce yourselves. And, you know, you're welcome to find out who, who else is in the room here. I, I'm guessing I'm the oldest, so I'll go first. <laughs> <laughs> Age before beauty. Um, my name is Jill Schottenfeld. And um, as I said, I was in the original Massachusetts cohort that Jane and Becky trained i think it's 12 years ago it's oh my god i don't want to even think about it anymore and um i first trained as a star teacher but then trained as a trainer the next year so i've been training for about 10 or 11 years uh, god only knows and um right now uh, through all those years i was teaching star and training star at the same time and i was both the administrator and a teacher in the programs i was in so it was an interesting balance uh, right now, I work in South Boston, if any of you know the area, at a, at a place called Julie's Family Learning. Uh, we um, deal with women who are at risk. We're a small program. We basically are one stop. We give them everything. You name it, child care. Everything from child care to diapers to high sets to <laughs> housing, mask cards, whatever they need, we are there for them. And um, it, last year was horrible. Uh, our women are um, all over the place with kids. And so doing Zooms was not possible. So I did star asynchronously, there's a mouthful, for over a year. And I developed quite a few um, ways to do that. And um, actually I made a couple of videos that uh, ACL, oh, you wouldn't know what ACLS is, oh my God. The Boston, uh, the gods in Boston, let's just say are, right now approving and they should be available at, at some point. There's also a round table happening next month that I am to Joan says you can be invited to. So that would be great too. Um, right now we're in flux. We just started in person a little while ago. So things are kind of, we're in person, but um, I haven't done too much star this year yet, but I'm always willing to help anyone who needs it because I think it's a fantastic program and it's making me sad that I think, um, I think it may be on the way out training wise. Jill, go for it. Hey everybody, I'm Jillian Moriarty. Am I echoing? Is that okay? No, nope. it's echoing over here. Um, so I'm in Worcester, Massachusetts and I have been a star trainer for six years now, teaching star for seven, which again, seems impossible, but um, yeah. So I work in a small program. Um, I work for Quinn Sigamon Community College, which is a larger adult ed program. Um, I teach off site in a housing unit that, um, that we have about 15 students in. Um, like Joni said, last year was a complete nightmare trying to teach anything virtually. Um, fortunately this year we are, um, in person one day a week and um, virtual two days a week. So we just started last week. Um, we got all of our assessments done the week prior. So we're gonna see how this goes. I noticed a lot of the questions were about teaching STAR um, virtually and through a Zoom, um, which I think we have mastered as much as we possibly could. Um, <laughs> you know, the students were learning. So yesterday I was explaining to my students about you know tier two words and they were asking some good questions about why we why are they doing this you know why are we working in this book and um they were such great questions and i kind of got to give my little spiel about star and the evidence based and why we do it and how we do it and the strategies and it kind of um refueled reignited my love for star because i was like you know what like what we do is good and it works and the students were motivated. And um, so it was a perfect timing for this call because um, now I I'm re fell in love with STAR after a crazy year of, of COVID-19. So, um, and like Joni said, we're more than happy to help. We, um, we have some experience through the years and it's kind of crazy and hard and difficult the first year that you start um, just trying to figure out the hours and the times and what and how and why and where. Um, so please feel free to reach out to us, ask any questions. We have seen it all. 
Um, <laughs> so we have no problems answering any questions honestly and how we teach and how we um, train. So please feel free. I, I'm just going to add one thing. I still remember the very first year that I was teaching, um, I was a former high school teacher and you know, taught English the way you did, but you know, you, you give them something to read, you assume they've read it, you ask questions, it wasn't working at all. So when I finally saw Star, I said, I, I, I got to get me some of this and forced my boss to go, drag Mike along with me. And within a month or two, using it, it was like, oh my God. I mean, I didn't even think to use the diagnostics. I didn't even think, who knew, you know, you have to sit down and give them tests even see what levels they're at. You know, you just teach, mm -hmm. right? So that first year was so eye-opening to me and my students' results in that first year were nothing short of amazing. So ever since then, it's been like, yep, I'm all in on this. So should we start with the questions that we've gotten or? I, we I would this? start with some of the questions you've got because I think you got a pretty good structure of questions there. So I would go with that. And then anybody in the chat or you can just, you know, ask if, um, some questions arise within the questions that you send. Um, and Joni, I don't have them printed out. So if you wouldn't mind being the, the reader. I'll read them. That's okay. Okay. So the first question I have um, is, can you talk about making adaptations for students with LD? For instance, some of my students would really benefit with hands-on activities, especially in regard to understanding the vocabulary. So I'm not sure what you mean, whoever, what hands-on, what, what is, I will say one thing about STAR, it is not specifically aimed toward anybody with learning disabilities. However, it is one of the better tools for people with learning disabilities mm -hmm. because everything is so specific and everything is explained slowly and everything is gone over in different ways and you do things visually and you do things orally and um, that it is aimed toward, you know it's specifically intermediate fourth through eight. So you're dealing with levels fourth grade through eighth grade. And so it is just good teaching period. And um, it helps people with learning disabilities. Um, hands on. Who's does anybody? Who was this somebody's question? Questions. Yeah. yeah, that was me. Um, yeah. okay. There was uh, I, unfortunately now I can't remember the word, but there was um, a word that came up where the definition itself was a little bit more difficult, and I thought um, like more of an active um, demonstration of the word might have been better. Um, so I can't think of the word. Are you doing, are you, I mean, obviously they taught you about the prompts and going around the room and everybody, you give your example, personal prompts. Yeah. And, okay. Um, tier two words are tricky. They look very innocuous. They sit there and you go, oh, this is an easy word. Mm -hmm. And then you start thinking of the definition, you go, shoot. <laughs> Some of them are just very difficult to get across. They're not concrete like tier one words. They're not so specific like tier three that you can really zero in. They cover everything. Mm -hmm. Sometimes words are rough. And um, I try to spend as much time as I can on every word. I try to make sure they have con uh, context, different context for every word. Um, I. Jill, do you do anything? I mean, they write them down on index cards. They write them down. So what I, mean I have, um, so for hands-on, and I've seen this used a couple times in different um, classrooms that I've observed, with the vocabulary words, um, what you could do is, um, you know, with your, if you're doing a quadrant chart, you know, you could have them printed beforehand and have them kind of puzzle piece them together. That's one way that, that you could do um, maybe a hands-on activity. Um, Another one that I saw was in comprehension and uh, one of the, and I, I, I also did this and it was, um, I was being observed and Marilee said, that's a great idea. So it was, I cut out the paragraphs um, of the story and had them put them in order. So they had oh. physical, like they did hand, it was hands-on. Um, those are the two examples that 
that I could offer um, if you're talking about hands-on. Um, and Joni just mentioned, you know, when they're looking, when your students are looking at tier two word, tier two words, you know, yesterday we had, um, I introduced five words yesterday for the first time with this group. And they're like, oh, these words are easy. And I was like, all right, yeah, perfect. Um, I used, um, I'll have to come back with the book now because of course um, I can't think of it off the top of my head. Oh, words to learn by. Um, and I was using uh, building vocabulary. So we were in chapter one, the word was item. And yeah, of course we know what that word is. And I said, okay, you know, and I gave a couple of examples and I said, could somebody else give an example um, using the prompts? And they were like, huh, They're like this is, it's harder than, it's hard to come up with just, I, and I said, exactly. Like you might sit back and say, oh, I don't have to do this. This is so easy. I know all of these words. But when prompted, they didn't, they didn't. And it was a word is, is to us as simple as item. And they couldn't. And they said, this is why we have to do all these quadrant charts, miss, right? And I'm like, exactly. So um, it kind of just uh, reiterated the fact that, you know, what we have to do, like some of these steps and strategies might seem boring, especially when you've been doing them for a long time, but, but they do work. Yeah, like the other day, um, I introduced five words that don't ask me what they were. And um, again, you get the same reaction, but then I go, hold on, we're, because you are always telling them that um, you're going to learn, words have many different meanings, but we're going to specifically learn this meaning. Mm -hmm. So, oh, I think it might have been recognized. I know you all know what it means to recognize someone in the street, but I'm giving you a different definition today. And they're like, oh. So um, zeroing in very specifically, as remember, you always give them the definition, never say, who knows the definition of this word? Because you are so lost. Somebody's gonna come up with the wrong definition. That's what sticks in their head, hang it up. So you make sure you give them the definition that you are teaching very specifically and they were writing it down. Mm -hmm. I make sure they're always writing it down. I never give them anything until we've gone through all the words, all the prompts, talked about them, we agree on them, then they're ready to work perhaps on a worksheet or something else. Mm -hmm. So zeroing in on stuff, giving them index cards, it's called a quadrant chart. Somebody had a question I saw. Yeah, I saw it in the chart, um, in the in the chat. Uh, what are you calling your charts? They're called, we call them quadrant charts. So the they're four. divided in four. Yeah, they divide it into four. Um, that's that must be old school star Joni coming no, out. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> it's part of the materials in yeah. the vocabulary section. Right. Yeah. yeah. The quadrant charts. Um, and then. Yeah, I, I just didn't understand what you were saying. I said I think that's what she's talking about, yeah, but the quadrant charts sounded yeah. muffled. See, but then again, you let them do whatever they want. My students love using index cards. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are words on the front and they put down anything else that helps them remember the word, just like in the quadrant chart. Um, how do you use it? A sentence, an example, um, a picture, whatever will help you remember that word. Yep. And then um, Carrie, the question was, can you repeat the second, the way that I did the hands-on was um, I was yeah. using the book that I use um, for a lot of this in the very beginning is... Um, timed reading in social studies, timed reading in science, so that you can, you know, get the science, um, you know, curriculum in into what you're teaching in STAR, which is huge. Um, and I would just, and they're short, there's only, there are only a couple of paragraphs. Um, and for them to just get, you know, the order on how they're reading, um, I just cut them up and put them in a pile and then gave them to them. And then they had to put them in order so that they could see first, middle, last, or however the- So you did the cut up method. You did use the whole sentence, obviously, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And I cut them out by paragraphs. So they mm. would have each paragraph. And it only- do, We had to do that at our STAR training. Do you remember that? It was one of the things they gave us to do. Oh, I don't remember that. It was part of a comprehension thing. Yeah. Oh, oh. I re that was, it, it's funny. I haven't used it since. I, maybe I should think about it. Yeah, they had a, they got a kick out yeah. of it. And I'm like, how is this- how does this person, you know, walk down the river when they haven't gotten to the river yet? Like, so, you know, it started a lot of conversation. So those oh, yeah. are just two examples of hands-on. Um, Karen, I don't know if that 
answered any of your question, however, <laughs> um, just a couple of examples. We also ask them, I'm always asking them at the end of uh, the, I'm, I, we've discovered over the years, I used to try to jam in 10, too much. Five a week. Oh, sometimes I think that's even, one of our questions. Five sometimes week. even, yeah, five every two weeks, depending on what your schedule is. Mm -hmm. I tell them, I want you to own that word. I don't want you just to memorize it. I want you to use it. I want you to go out and use it in um, your Instagram post. I want you to use it in your Facebook, uh, if they even use Facebook anymore. Use it so that it is something that you, you know, it's in your pocket. You'll have it whenever you can. Come back and tell me, where have you heard that word? I want you to tell me for homework, have you read that word this week? Have you heard that word? I'll never forget one of my students said, oh my God, suddenly I'm understanding all this stuff because now I understand the words. It's like, I know English now. And it was it, it was kind of sobering when he said stuff, something like that. So it's not a member of memorizing it. It's a matter of really, really, really understanding the word. So I'm sure Jill has it too. You have word walls, all the words go up yeah. on the wall. We go back to it. Um, anything we can to help them uh, write sentences with all the words. I want you to write a paragraph um, using all the words, things like that. When, when the students use them in the class um, after, you know, teaching them and they hoot and holler if somebody uses the word, you know, like, and it's hysterical. Um, yep. it's funny to see. Um, I have another, another question. I've been using the quadrant charts, but some of my students um, have such a difficult time copying. So, uh, and it does take a long time. And as the teacher virtually, and you're sitting there and you're like, are they done writing their quadrant charts out? Right? Like it seems to be um, take a long time. Um, it gets, it gets way easier once the students are used to writing quadrant charts. Um, you know, my students know, and you can, you can photocopy, you know, blank quadrant charts. I think that's very helpful. Um, and you can even put the words in and the definitions in, in the beginning, because you're giving them the word and the definition. So, and then eventually kind of have them fill in all of them. Um, but that could save a little bit of time in the beginning. I always write the word and the definition and anything else on the board. And some of my students yeah. take a picture with their phones and then they use that to go home or on there on the bus and, you know, anything on the phone they're going to look at. Oh, Carrie, definitely. You could do this together. 100%. Oh, you should be. Yeah. What I do um, on my, when I'm teaching virtually and I'm doing the quadrant charts is I use the whiteboard and um, you can draw lines with the whiteboard and I just, and we do it together. Um, we do them together for the first, until they're ready to move on. And then I give them, um, you know, maybe just the definition and have them do the sentences, but yeah, definitely do them together in the beginning. Um, so they get the strategy down. Um, and the whiteboard was my, was worked well. Sorry. I was wondering, Carrie, do you mean like a shared doc? Yeah, I actually made it more like a shared Google Doc where everybody actually physically does it together. Maybe that could be a second level of that because yeah. I didn't even think about the whiteboard. The whiteboard yeah. would be a great way to, to model. Yeah, definitely. Because I immediately went to a shared doc where they could, where kind of like letting some of the pressure off of them mm -hmm. to do everything on their own. Like, and so they have like somebody's working on one thing or maybe somebody comes with like, just maybe like, you know how they get kind of um, discouraged if they feel like Can't it's all it. on them. Yeah. No, absolutely. Are you talking about in person or virtually now? We, virtually, we better... because you could use virtually. a yeah, right. Google Doc. You could just yeah. make the yeah. template yeah. and yeah. then you invite them and they but the only thing about that is they would have to have the skill to do it. So it might be a little separate. Right. I don't know. Like it would depend on the group. Some people I don't use it and I should, but our we decided not to use it. Um, but people keep talking about something called Padlet where you I could literally yeah, where you can literally post things constantly so you're all working on it together jill go ahead because you said you use it i don't use padlet my kids oh use okay it. Oh, your but, kids use it okay yeah, yeah. there so, are so many software programs out there you know we had to our program had to decide what are we going to use for god's sakes but padlet really interested me but we never adopted it where they literally put sticky notes all over the place <laughs> on the on you see it on the on the screen and it's kind of cool I think I've, I've used Padlet like a little bit, but not much. And I think we end up, I tend to work with the Google suite because it's a work skill as yeah. well. And so mm -hmm. like, you're like picking up, like 
Padlet's cool, but like how many people are going to use it in the workforce? So like you're like kind of double timing. Yeah. No, I agree. Well, with you. you're not gonna, the only reason I say that is because, like, as I said, we didn't have any Zooms. And so whatever we could use to make it more engaging yeah. and more, you know, I mean, I was I mean, I'm constantly doing Google Forms with them and videos. I do a lot of videos, um, PowerPoint, you name it. You know, I've done it. But um, it's hard when when you're on a Zoom with them, it's easier to recreate a classroom. And Jill was able to do that. When you're a totally asynchronous, it's 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 challenging. Mm -hmm. So you do whatever works and whatever is good for them, <laughs> whatever is the easiest. Seriously. Yeah, and I don't want to get across. into um, into it now, but um, I've been using Kahoot with the vocabulary word, and then you can put the definition, or you can write the definition, and then put the vocabulary word and um it's not a staff strategy however it's very fun um what is this kahoot it's a fun game you'll have to look and look at it I, I won't go into it now because it's not a staff strategy but okay um, good <laughs> yeah i i fun. used um quizlet with i, yeah, I was doing like a pilot for four weeks and did 10 words a week following like lesson plans they had but i had uh, put it all into a google classroom and so they could get the um quadrant charts and the knowledge, whatever, you know, your prior knowledge. Well, yeah. But so they would fill out the um, the quadrant chart on their own, but then they would hand it into Google Classroom too. So I could like, you know, check on it and make sure that, you know, that they had the idea. But um, with using Quizlet just kind of added a fun thing towards the end mm -hmm. of each week. And we did Quizlet live and did them they had these match things. So it was fun review. It was not a star thing, but I figure star would approve because yeah. um, well, well, as long as you're using the strategies to teach oh, yeah. Yeah. anything oh, yeah. extra is fine. I right. do it in the beginning. I use it in the beginning of the classes I review and I, and I include all the words from the past, not just those five that I introduced. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's fun, but all right, Joni, next question. We're going to move on. That was on. Yeah, we better. Um, We're not I, even on the topic anymore. No, this is like, I have been noticing that I have several students who score lower on vocabulary and fluency than they do on comprehension. It seems surprising to me. How, how can they do well on comprehension if they're not reading fluently? I'm assuming that means aloud at that level or if they have lower scores in vocabulary. I wondered if the reading passages and or comprehension questions, I'm guessing in the diagnostic test are too easy. Whose question? Okay, are you dealing with a lot of ESOL students? They're all native speakers? Or have they come up through the ranks? Not all, but um, I mean, yeah, a, a lot of them are English. Most of them it's, are English. Uh, it's it isn't very common that that happens, although it do, it has obviously yeah, and um, definitely with ESOL students. Yeah, people it could who, be um, it could be the diagnostic assessment that you're using, like you said. Maybe the comprehension questions are too easy. Um, and well, what it, what are you using, Karen? Uh, the bait the bait is it the baiter that we got the um that. We were given the materials. The DAR, do you guys DAR? That's what we use. Up Probably in not. The DAR is an amazing yeah. test. Yeah. No. Um, uh, no, I think it's the beater. Well, like what I can say is, um, if you're using the assessments and that's what you're you're referring to for the questions and where they, you will see. I wouldn't worry. I wouldn't stress. I wouldn't even think twice about it um, because once you get your students into um, into their levels and their groupings, you're gonna be able to see like, okay, maybe their comprehension is better than I thought and they don't need the strategies or they guessed and they're very good guessers um, and their vocabulary really does need help or vice versa. So you'll be able to adjust the groupings as you go and you should be adjusting the groupings as you go as people start to master. So, um, you know, the assessment is a starting point but once you're working with your students, it, it's okay to adjust their levels. So, yeah. and, they, and, and not every so student, important. that's just not every important to know because, um, cause it happens all the time. Like, you know, the groupings, wait a second, I think that you should be here or you should be, you know, this book's too re easy if you're doing um, collaborative oral reading and I'm going to 
challenge you a little bit more or it's too difficult and you go down a level. Um, it's, it's normal to have to do that, so. I don't know if you've gotten there, but not every student needs everything. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's so, another question, Joni. Do you want to yeah, ask but, that but question? As long as it's in the, I mean, um, if they're doing really well on comprehension, if, and you're talking about fluency reading aloud, I, I wouldn't worry that much about it. But if they need vocabulary, you give them vocabulary. But they mean need vocabulary, you know, although tier two encompasses everything. Um, you see what they need and you put them in a starting level and then you're always watching what they need. So don't, um, don't stress out too much. Yeah. About Another that. question is, what have you found to be the preferred amount of time? So we, um, in the beginning, I felt like my star class kind of extended over an hour, maybe an hour and 15 minutes. I try to keep it to an hour um, and I try to do 20 minutes per strategy that I'm teaching for component that I'm teaching. Um, so if, if they need vocabulary, 20 minutes of vocabulary. And, it, and you have to kind of, I don't wanna say set a timer because you don't wanna set a timer, but you know, be very conscious of your time because you get involved and you get these great questions and you don't wanna move on, but you know, evidence-based shows that you need quick, short lessons. Um, and if you're going over, that's not evidence and that's not, um, they're not gonna benefit from it. Over, you know, and you're saying, oh, if I just finish this lesson or if we just finish one more chapter or whatever it is, um, you know, you're not, nobody's going to come in and arrest you. However, you know, the evidence is that, you know, keep them short 20 minutes per, per um, component for about an hour a class. Um, and I'm just going to keep talking about how often you should have a class. Um, my class is, I have, um, I go Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. So I do three hours of star a week. Um, and that seems to be pretty consistent with a lot of adult education programs, especially in the state of Massachusetts right now. Um, so um, yeah, so I do about an hour and I divide them into 20 minute components. And yeah, yeah it's definitely all the research and evidence has shown that short lessons over periods of time. I, I remember the beginning, we would go, well, I'm doing star two hours on Wednesdays. They'd be like, ah, no. Uh, what if they're absent on Wednesday? That's it, they've missed star for two weeks. So the best thing is, I mean, Massachusetts, we used to advocate three times a week. We went down to two at one point, but a minimum of two times a week because you have to just keep, it's true for anything. You know, if, if you only offer it once a week or even twice a week, they're absent on those two days and then you're gone. The next week they're, they're racing to catch up. Um, and Kerry, another thing is, um, I think this was your, maybe it wasn't your question was, um, you know, sometimes it takes a little bit longer to get through those five vocabulary words because you're only meeting for 20 minutes a day, three days a week. So it gets easier and the flow goes a lot smoother after, you know, a month or two or two months or a year, however long um, your students are with you and, you um, so yeah, it does take a little bit of time. 10, I think Susan is a lot of vocabulary words. I would definitely cut that in half. Yeah, um, that's what, what Jane from um, Star had suggested. Had said yep, you. absolutely too yeah, many yeah. words. Too I, many. I used to do that, it was too much. I'd be uh, so overwhelmed. Um, what, I'm sorry, Joan, do, do, do There was a question, question on the chat that yeah. I didn't understand. Um, is this a standalone class? What do you Am mean I a Standalone class. It, it was, that was my question. So it's just a star class. It's not part of a, a language arts class or star. It's, a, it, it's part of language arts, but it's your reading part. Yeah. Remember that it is, as Jane told me so many years ago when I went, oh my God, how am I going to do this? I can't add all this plus on this. She said, calm down. You're not adding this. You're replacing when you did whatever you did for reading before, you're now replacing it with this. Mm -hmm. But that being said, when you're doing comprehension, you're also covering, I'm also covering social studies and science because those are the texts I'm using. I use uh, fiction and nonfiction for that. And they're always reading either science or social studies. And then you've got probably more, you know, your next hour is writing. Well, that's perfect. Whatever you've discussed, let's say here, you can bring over to your writing class or whatever, but try. It's hard with, it's very hard with STAR to realize you're just focusing on that. But 
in the beginning, it's very hard. You know, we're teachers, we're holistic. We want to teach everything all the time. We want to help everybody all the time. Doesn't help. Be focused. Yeah. Pat, you have a question? Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I don't know if this is the right time to jump in, but um, right now, Sue is doing this as part of her class because she's practicing it. But our organizationally, I, I'm wondering whether or not this can be the ABE reading class. Yeah. You know, can we actually get to the point where we recruit students um, for this and they're going to be doing, this is going to be their reading class for like eight weeks or that's another thing I'd like to talk about is what the, what the um, number of weeks is that you suggest we have. But has it been done that way? Has it been where, you know, we're recruiting, people are buying into this and this is what we're going to do for eight weeks for your reading for ABE? But this is, it's, Keep in mind, this is for intermediate readers, levels right. four through eight, okay? Yeah. Um, my, and as for that, I mean, they're stressing managed enrollment, which means you're the one that's gonna set how many weeks you want that to be, obviously. So you're saying every eight weeks, you're gonna enroll new students? Is that I mean, I don't saying? know. I mean, you know, we have 10 week semesters now. Mm -hmm. And we also have rolling, not rolling, um, we have the ability, no, we don't have rolling admissions. Oh. What we have is um, we're always rolling enrollment. You know, we're always register or we're registering new students probably two months or so before mm -hmm. classes actually start. So we always, I think we can always have a base of individuals who could fit into this. Again, I don't know. I'm just, we're, we're trying to experiment with this, um, but since I only have one staff member at this point who's being trained in this, I, my intention was to try to see if we can just find individuals who've been stuck for a while mm -hmm. in our ABE classes That's great. and recruit them you know, and kind of explain this to them and that this is it. This, this is their going to be their reading course for X amount of time. Well, no, every single program we've ever trained has the same problem. How do we manage this? How many weeks? I mean, everybody, ha and, and you don't have ACLS, we do down our backs, you know, the minute there are empty seats, they're up in arms. So right. we're always, you know, empty seats, empty seats. Um, it's very rough and you have to experiment and come up with what's good for you. Six weeks, eight weeks. Managed enrollment is important and definitely it's a great tool. I mean, you could come up with this great marketing star, you know, this is what it's gonna do for you. Keep in mind, if they can't read, they can't do anything else. So you st they, they, they're only at, a, let's say, a, a fifth grade reading level and you stick them in a high set class, they're, they're going to be lost. So if they you can't teach them to read, that you know, th they really are at a deficit for everything else. So I think it's a great marketing opportunity. And that's why it was developed, because they could see that it was the intermediate student that would say, stay in the same class for two or three years and not move. And so that's why STAR was actually developed to zero in on them and to get them moving quickly. And if it's taught correctly, they do move quickly and they can get up to that high set level. Uh, you have to figure it out. Um, it, it's, you know, you have to see what works best for your program. But if you think marketing this to your intermediate readers, I think they'd be excited about it. You know, we're going to actually zero in on your reading and we're going to make sure you can read and move up. So, uh, oh, I'm, I keep, it's, it's distracting. I'm looking at the chat. Oh, I use six way paragraphs for comprehension. That's my Bible. <laughs> <laughs> I use the timed reading, especially if a student's, because um, fo it focuses on content area as well. And they're short. And then, oh, so the six way paragraph. Yeah, that's true. Um, at the end um, of timed reading, there's like six comprehension questions that can be done for homework, you know, because it's outside of, of STAR. But I really enjoy those books. Um, and six way yeah. paragraphs is great as well. Yeah, Would I love six way paragraphs them? because it's. Um, it's got everything um, and it's divided into science, uh, social studies, ELA, they're short, they're uh, leveled, uh, change agent. Yes, I absolutely use the change agent. I love it and use it, Newzella and um, what else? I use ReadWorks a lot. ReadWorks constantly. Um, yeah, yep. 
Absolutely. Especially exactly. virtually. Yeah. Um, I noticed that I was using ReadWorks um, oh. a lot. Oh yeah, that's that's my Google Classroom go to. Yeah, so. read works. It's fantastic. Although New Zella, um, they used to be free and now they're charging for it, but we bought the subscription. So I'm using that as well now. All right. Next question, Joni. Oh, I thought you had them in front of you. Okay. I, no, I don't uh, have them. Oh, because you kept saying, um, do you have any data on the effectiveness of in-person versus virtual star? No, <laughs> we don't. Sorry. Um, have you tried any models that are a combination of virtual and in-person classes? Yeah, so I'm doing that now. I think I explained it. Um, any other questions on that? So I guess I can break it down um, on Wednesday, on Tuesdays, uh, Wednesdays and Thursdays. Um, this is new, so it's fresh and new a couple weeks in. So don't, it could change next week, but um, I have been working with the students um, and my goal is to work with them in person on Wednesdays and do the vocabulary words, a couple of the strategies um, on the following virtual days. So I like to be in person and kind of explain it to see them to, um, and then work on the strategies, maybe the first one on Thursday and then review it back on Tuesday. Um, that's my goal. Um, but I mastered the whole virtual, not mastered by any means, I did virtual for um, the whole last year. So um, it, it works um, not as well. And, it, you know, I don't think the outcomes were quite as good as they're going to be this year with at least one day in person, but um, it can be done with a, an imagination. We <laughs> and came, a sense of humor. You need a sense yeah, of humor that's as what well. You need. So, uh, we came back briefly in the spring and I tried doing in-person classes and Zooming at the same time. Um, some of our other classes still do that. It's, it's a challenge. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get very many people taking me up on that. So if they could come in virtually uh, in person, they did. They didn't take advantage of the Zoom, but I was also running Google Classroom. That's what they were doing. So um, Google Classroom has saved it. Everything's on Google Classroom. Oh my God. I'm, that's our next question, which is perfect. Oh. It said, um, a few times we did that. Are you running star classes online? Okay, so as I said, I was asynchronous for um, a year at least, maybe more. And so what I was doing for vocabulary was I would do a PowerPoint of my five words, making it as colorful and cheery as possible. I would then make a Zoom video of that, of me reading the whole thing and going through it slide by slide. We had our own YouTube station. So I would uh, post it on YouTube and then include that in my Google form, uh, my, my Google Classroom. So they would click, they had to watch the video. And then I attached a Google form and that's where I did my fill in the blanks and, um, and, and all the other star things. And I always made sure I put Easter eggs in the video. So if they didn't watch the video, they couldn't really do the Google form, even though I did include the definitions in the Google form. So I would know immediately if they watched the video, you can also click on YouTube and see how many people watch the video, but you don't know who. So I'm still doing that. Um, even though we're in person, we're maintaining a Google classroom. So I am doing that every week. And those are the words we also cover in class. So they have the opportunity if they're sick, if their kids are sick, if whatever, they can just go on Google Classroom. Do um, I do other things besides vocabulary. We do a IXL and, and, and Khan Academy and the math is doing the same thing in another class because we thought it was very important to maintain it. ACLS is actually asking us to do that. We have to maintain some sort of um, virtual environment. And um, I have noticed that people who don't come in are getting onto Google Classroom. So we'll see. We've only been in person for about a month now. So we'll see what happens. So that's what I'm doing. Um, I'm just wondering, and maybe I should know this, um, <laughs> with the STAR toolkit that's online, Everybody has access to that. They're doing the modules through there. The, um, the 
information that you can get on there, the, um, the resources have saved my life um, with the vocabulary lesson plans that are already developed. You got your words, you got everything is already developed in there. Um, that has absolutely saved my life, um, especially going virtual because I can just copy it and put it all in my Google Classroom. Um, they have the vocabulary word and then they have all the, um, the strategies followed and I would just cut them into the vocabulary words. And then, you know, if they're only using one strategy at a time, like fill-ins or um, whatever it would be, I only post that one strategy in the Google Classroom. Um, that is huge. And I highly, highly suggest you use those. There's also writing prompts that go along with those. Um, so, you know, you could use those in the next class if you're doing writing later or for homework. So it does have lesson plans for um, all of your STAR um, components, as well as like extra work for a writing class. Please use those resources. They will save your life. <laughs> I swear by them. <laughs> the other thing for those of you using Google Classroom that I, nah, sorry about that, that I include in my, um, I hope it's like a bill collector, Joan. It's garbage. It's always garbage, <laughs> unless it's a doctor or something. It better not be a doctor. Um, so I, we have a resources section at the top of my Google Classroom. And in that, I, I do a lot of instructional videos. I've done comprehension, summarizing. So if I after I teach it, I say, well, if you've forgotten what I, I've taught and you don't want to want to do it at home alone, go watch the video. So videos is saved me <laughs> yeah. um i'm gonna do you want me to show you where i get those activities can i show you can i share my screen um so yes, so here is uh, where you guys you know you'll log in this is all of our um you know our star home page um under the resources um and i was specifically talking about vocabulary because it's incredible. Um, let me see if I can find vocabulary. Comprehension. So this- Comprehension, yeah, move, yeah, go up a little. So this is all your- There it is, right there, right there, right there. Okay, so, right. no, those are just, um, oh yeah, so let me see, what do I use? Vocabulary lesson, right here, vocabulary lesson planning template. Nope, that's not what I want. Oh, right here. <laughs> These right here, these vocabulary units are, you'll, you're going to send me flowers after you see this. Um, here, so it has every vocabulary um, strategy that you want to use. If you click on the unit, I don't know if it's going to let me open it right now because that would be way too easy. I got to tell you, you're great, Jill. After 10 years of teaching, I have so much of my old stuff. I don't even look around for anything. Oh, else. It's, this is, yeah. So, so here, you know, teacher notes, you got to, you know, copy and delete where it says teacher notes because you don't want to get caught. But, um, and these are all free. <laughs> They're all designed. They're all for you to use. So you get all of your vocabulary words and all of your um, prompts. Here's all your prompts that you need. So um, they start with the 10, but here are all the strategies that you can use. So in the beginning, I only use the matching. We'd start with that. And then maybe the next week, if they could get the matching down, then we added the fill in the blank activity. Um, there's the close activity. There's um, more matching. So you got to kind of cut and paste what you want to use because you don't have time for all of this. There's, this is, has um, more fill-ins, but this one has two words for the fill-ins. If, you know, if you're working with somebody that finishes everything really quickly, you could give them another sheet. Um, you could do it for homework. The sentence completion is amazing. Um, and then I was telling you true, false. You got your true and false. You got your, oh, and then the writing prompt. So this is what I would use um, for my next steps for homework or if somebody wants to start their writing because it has the vocabulary words that you're using. So it's just a follow-up. Um, yes, no, wise, um, more, and um, I'll show you something else that you're going to love. Sorry if I'm making you dizzy. 
this is what I used last month when I did my for and I used I we were just doing star for an hour and a half four times a week and wow. I covered a unit I covered a unit a week mm-hmm. and um did pretty much all of these things but I had also put it all in Google Classroom and unveiled it like as we went along and they also did homework each night and it worked really well. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of a lot to get it up on Google Classroom and yeah. organize it all, but um, once you get it done once, it's all set. It's saved in your Google Docs, and you can just take it right. for the next class. The other thing I want to show you um, here is that all the answers are here for you as well. So it's it's all answers, so you can check them as they go. So that was um, so that is huge. That'll save you hours. I didn't know about this when I first started teaching, and um, I, it took me so long to, um, to work, to, to get lesson plans together. I wish I had known that this was around, um, beforehand. Um, and then I don't think I have star opened anymore, so I can't go back to it. <laughs> right. So I, I wanted know. to, um, just ask real quick, because I, I only see like you, I don't see the word that I, I did on my own. Like I opened it up on word so I could see it, but we, we can't see it on the screen. So if you didn't open it, it might not make sense. It's, you but didn't see what I, I was talking well about? Your it's well work. worth your time to open it in our resources because it really is. Oh, it didn't even show you what I was doing. Yeah, I'm just trying oh. to tell you. It, like, I could see it because I opened it up, but if somebody didn't open it, they would only see the units. Yeah. Just, okay. like, it might not make sense when somebody was, I'm just Okay, so to. definitely. Okay, thank you for saying that because I didn't open it in Word. You're right. Um, Jill, this wasn't originally available. This di- didn't become, this particular stuff wasn't available until they switched us over to um, the new, what do you call it? The new online virtual training. And they started adding all this great stuff. So well, that's, why, that's why you didn't see it in the beginning because it wasn't there. Well, and the great thing about all the um, practice activities too is that they do um, set it up that the easier ones like matching and one fill in the blank are the first ones you would do with them. Yeah. And yeah. then they get progressively more difficult. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that's, good. that's the way star yeah. works. Yeah. yeah. You, you start out with the easier and you go to the. Oh, I'm so, I'm so mad that you guys didn't see what I was work, looking at. They'll find it. They're right. I know. But... <laughs> they can ask Becky and Jane next week too. Yeah. I think we, it's okay. We, it's just like if in case anybody was confused, yeah. all yeah. you have to do is click on it. Yeah. So click on it and it gives you everything. Um, and the answers are there. And um, so they have, and what I do is, you know, from those resources that you can also, um, they have all the templates in there that you can share. You can put those in your Google classroom so that if somebody's absent, you can refer them back to. So definitely use those resources as much as you can. Right. Um, any more questions? Wes, yeah, would I don't know these, maybe you do. Would using Lexia or MindPlay virtual reading, uh, it's not ended, I guess. I, I don't know what Lexia or MindPlay are. Yeah, we don't that, use that. Was my, that was my question. Um, Lexia is a, is a um, computer-based phonics program that was designed for people who are dyslexic. Mm-hmm. Um, so it covers, you know, the short vowel sounds, and it, you know, goes up to whatever. So I, my, I'm curious about whether or not, and Mind Play does something similar. So the the question is, can have you used any of those types of programs to uh, deal with the alphabetics and fluency, as opposed to like, um, you know, teaching them directly? So I haven't personally, I haven't, um, I don't use those. I don't have a lot of students that are, that use alphabetics at all. Right. Um, most of okay. my students have dropped out of like Worcester public schools. So they, they are pretty far past um, alphabet, needing any alphabetics. Um, but like I, what I would suggest and what I would say is kind of how we use um, Kahoot and the other games, like use them as supplement to start. It might not be a star strategy, but definitely like as an introduction or a way to follow up and see where they are um, and to add some fun because if you're teaching virtually, it's very not, it's very boring. It's not fun. So the games kind of, but definitely um, if they're aligned, like somebody said in the chat, if they're aligned and 
um, absolutely use them. Yeah, I, like Jill, um, hopefully if you really are teaching levels four through eight, they're all doing advanced alphabetics. You won't have anybody who needs phonics. That's more decoding and um, introductory. Um, occasionally, you know, your class gets mixed up and you do, but usually you shouldn't. And advanced alphabetics is more about, you know, prefixes, suffixes, root words, um, syllabication, things like that. So you're not dealing with it. But that being said, um, there's a series of books called Mega Words, which is amazing. And um, it goes, covers everything. And um, once you've given your students, if your students get below a certain uh, grade, oh, I'm talking about the DAR, this isn't going well. If you think they need phonics, I know I'm so DAR based. Um, you give them the phonics test, um, Sylvia Green or whatever else you're using. And that test will tell you what exactly you need to be teaching them. So you don't teach them everything. You just teach them what they need. Then you go to something like mega words and you hone in on that particular skill and um, you, you know, put in some extra time um, individually, uh, unless you have, hopefully you won't have many students in your class who have that problem. Um, and you try to do that a few times a week. Um, but uh, hopefully in a star class, you shouldn't have to be dealing with that, but that's in the ideal world, which none of us live in, so. What do we got here? Where am I? I just had it, coach, considering. Ah, considering that students stop out of classes, what is a good number of students to place into a class and the number of weeks to offer a course. Oh, part of that we answered. Um, a great star class has, a, has up to eight to 10 students in it. I haven't had a class like that in a long time. <laughs> I get six, I'm thrilled. But more than 10 students, which when your normal times face to face, you're probably all gonna have, uh, you can do it, but it gets trickier. Um, I have yeah. right now, I have 17 registered. Whoa. However, it's the first week. So everybody's gung ho. I know that I'll lose a couple along the way. Um, but I also have a volunteer that comes in for my mm. collaborative oral reading. So that does make it easier. Um, but yeah, I would say 10. If I had 10, it would be magical. <laughs> I'll... All unicorns, if I had 10, it would be good. Yeah, you get the energy, but you have enough time. If you're doing prompts, it doesn't take two hours, you know, and um, uh, have I ever had that? I don't know, maybe once in the 10 years I've been doing it. So, so Joan, we were saying that your classes are usually smaller. Is that what you said? Yeah, yeah. Still, they were bigger, okay. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm now getting, I mean, hopefully I'll get up to eight, but as I said, ours, our component of Julie's is small anyway, and there's always something going on there, um, restraining orders, domestic violence, you name it, so we never know who's coming when, and so if I get six people in there, I'm like, oh my god, magic moment, you know, yeah. so. Thank you. Um... Ah, how does writing factor into this? Oh, I'm gonna have a fight with somebody. You can actually do some of the um, uh, vocabulary things. Like if you're doing yes, no, why, uh, especially really lends itself to it or read and respond. You can do it both orally and written. I've done it both ways, but to actually teach writing, it should be separate you can do your reading and then you can always link something like Jill mentioned earlier, you've just discussed something and now you'd like to write about it, but make sure it's outside of the star and it's a writing component of it. And you'll notice um, we, with the T charts and the comprehension um, kind of writing summaries at the end, um, that's more advanced for your students. You probably won't do that right away um, if you're new at star. But towards, you know, a couple of years in even, um, if you're doing the T-charts and you're doing um, summaries, that can lead into a very good reading, uh, writing class because you're, you're writing 
the summaries for what you're reading in your short stories. So, yeah, it's, it, that's it's a great, great question too, because, yeah. yeah, it's a good question because it's, you know, you got to kind of, you know, like I mentioned, setting a timer and, and following, you know, consistently what you're doing in your star classes. It, it, it very could easily turn into a writing class. Oh yeah, or, or all kind. Like I, I used to love my fluency. I, I, I haven't done it at all this year, but I would choose be very careful about the level. And you know, it's hard. I always seem to get the level. They're all usually level five to six. I very rarely get somebody who's higher than that. And so finding a book that is that level and is interesting to an adult can be very challenging, and, and not too long because you're you're doing your popcorn reading and something that's going to grab them. And I've, Jill's heard this a million times. I've had so many students who've never finished a book in their lives. And the idea of reading, reading aloud is, 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 you know, oh my God, how am I going to do this sort of thing? So, but when they get into it and they get into a book they love, it, it's, it, again, I'm using the word, but it's true. It's magical. It's like suddenly they open up and they love what they're reading and they can't wait but I always look at the time and 20 minutes, I'll be like, done. And they're like, no, no. And I love that sound. I go, yeah, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, and I take it home. They always say, no. I, I tell them, well, it depends. I don't let them. When I didn't have the, enough money and I only had enough money for a certain amount of books, I, I didn't. I would take it back from them. And when they were done with the book, it was theirs. And so by the end of the year, they built up a library. They had about, you know, six or seven books. But when I had enough money and I could, I would say, yeah, absolutely. Take it home and read, read in advance. But don't you dare tell anybody, somebody, I forgot what we were reading and somebody blurted out in class what actually happened. And the rest of the class, if they didn't kill that, that woman, she was very lucky to get out of there. <laughs> don't tell us. We didn't want to know. Anything you can do to build up enthusiasm and, and convince them that reading is fun and, and, you know, not just, well, you have to do this, you know, but it's, it's fun. So be careful about your choices, you know, of what you're giving them to read. Make sure it's, it's something that matters to them. Even if you're dealing with science and social studies, try to make it, you know, matter to them. Don't just say, well, I have to teach this, so I'm going to teach them, you know, the 13th Amendment or something, because it won't work. If it doesn't matter to them and they can't transfer it to their own lives, they're not going to learn it. It's going to go in one ear and out the other. Joan, um, your question, what is the ideal support a teacher needs to do STAR? You mean financially or? Um, I guess, so I guess I'm just thinking, um, you know, that some of the folks on the call are, you know, running the programs and some are the teachers. And I guess, you know, what does a teacher really need maybe from the admin or, you know, oh, how does a pro best constructed program to make this all happen? You know, I know Joni's been in at least a couple of programs where she's taught STAR. So, you know, what does that look like? What does that balance look like? Well, ideally, God bless STAR, whenever they would do a training would say the director has to come with their teacher. And there's a reason for that. If your director has no buy-in, the teacher sunk. The director has to really understand that this is important and it's going to take some time and resources. Mm -hmm. um, if your director's on the same page, you're already 50% of the way there. You know, yeah, of course it's ideal. I mean, you have to have time for prep. You have to have time. It's ideal, of course, to have a, two teachers so you can exchange ideas, but I've never had that. So, you know, um, the schedule, the managed enrollment, all of that has to be on the same page. If your director is fighting you on that, what do you mean managed enrollment? What do you mean you want it three times a week? You know, so the buy-in is like, you know, we were always been lucky in Massachusetts. Um, the state bought in, um, everybody bought in, and most of the directors really understood the importance of it. Volunteer help is always a great thing to have. Jillian has had it. I've never had it, unfortunately. I'm, I'm in, seem to be in smaller programs all the time. Uh, financially, you know, it's good to be paid for stuff like um, extra um, professional development and attending STAR and doing all that stuff. Um, somebody did just make a comment, um, Kerry. So, yes, the end benefit for the directors to see is students, the attendance in your STAR class will um, be consistent like more consistent than you've ever seen. And I think in a, in an ordinary reading class, because they know what to expect. 
they enjoy it because they, they know the strategy in there. They feel good about themselves, um, knowing the strategy and knowing what the next steps are. So yes, you're, you're correct. You know, your, your attendance goes up, your seating goes up, people are going through levels, they're passing tests, right? But even, yeah, but even more than the attendance, which is wonderful. I mean, like when they're looking at these numbers and they, and that group is difficult to move through the CASAS or the table, whatever people are using, because that particular group has such a wide gamut to reach before they hit the next level, we want to put that. So that's the thing that maybe people need to kind of reiterate back to their directors yeah. and their program managers, you know, like and, and, it will and benefit that, the program. Yeah, right? you'll see it, you'll see it. And then in turn, if they're rising through the levels, then your funding is increased. And, uh, you know, it might be worth the, the 10 books of, um, you know, that they're purchasing for the, the, the library or, or for the collaborative oral reading. Um, so I have a good, I wish I had my list with me of books um, that I use in my classroom. And I can always, if we're all on one email chain, I can come back with it. And um, yeah. um, I know that I have um, one of the books, we haven't started collaborative oral reading right now. Um, I'll think of it is, um, I'll, I'll get back to you with the whole list of books that I've read. They're all brand new. Um, my director let me pick out some topics. So I did ask students as well, um, what they would wanna read. And some of the topics are um, history-based, history-inspired. Um, it's gonna drive me nuts. Town, just, uh, yeah, I'd have to go look too because I've done, but Townsend Books puts out, not only do they put out the vocabulary series, but they have a series of novels, a series of novels. They're all leveled. Yeah. They used to be a buck a book. I think they've raised it to $2. So God bless them, it was cheap. Um, and they cover everything, a lot of historical novels. We've done things like Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks. Yeah, Rosa Parks was a biggie that we did. And um, um, they really do cover the gamut of levels and they add things all the time. They have a, even an urban series. Mm -hmm. That's um, big right now. A lot of my students yeah. ask for those, the urban, the romance. I'm like, we're not doing that. But, <laughs> uh, we're not get going there. But, um, you know, <laughs> oh, the perfect book that everybody loves, Seed Folks. Oh, I know, I'm so My so God, sad. that has got to be the perfect book. I'm going to do that this year. It is just such a community building, fantastic yeah. book. You're right. Um, I, I've, I had a whole list, and we only have one more question. We've done very well. Do you include each of the components in each class meeting? I know that not every student will need alphabetic, so I'm assuming that one could be dropped for some classes. I've been holding a pilot class for the past few weeks where we focus on learning 10 new vocabulary words each week with core, I'm, I'm not sure what that is, for fluency and, oh, collaborative oral reading, oh God. And it seems like an intense but manageable amount of work for students who are committed to the process. Should comprehension work be added to this, the same class? You want to take it or should I? You go, Jill. Well, I think I already um, explained a lot of that is that, yeah, you only need, you only, you're only teaching the three components at once. So alphabetics is usually um, not taught, um, especially for students that are at our level. It, it would be advanced alphabetics. And a lot of the times if, you know, if you have one student that needs advanced alphabetics or two students, you don't want to keep, it would be much easier for you personally as a teacher to kind of pull them aside, maybe give them some extra work in alphabetics and keep them with the rest of the class. Cause that'll go up very quickly with the star strategies in alphabetics. So um, yeah, you're gonna teach the three strategy, the three components. You're gonna work um, with them, you know, groupings or you, you'll do your groupings. Um, the three strategies, I would suggest three days a week, an hour class, 20 minutes per, per component. I think that's the question. And since I seem to have the lower level, it goes much quicker, I've noticed over the years. Um, if you have many students in your class who come up through the ranks from ESOL, even though they're, they've tested at the same level as a native speaker, it's going to take a much longer time. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, I've learned that the hard way. You know, why aren't they, you know. Also, if your levels tend to be higher in the class, they're going to move faster. So with my students, I tended to always start with fluency and vocabulary. Mm -hmm. 
and slowly add on comprehension. I didn't do it immediately because I, you will, I'm sure Jane and Becky keep telling you, if you can get your fluency rate up and your vocabulary, that improves your comprehension. So by the time we were ready for comprehension, maybe three months into the program, they were ready for comprehension and um, it wasn't such a battle and such a struggle. But it's up to you. It depends on who's in your class, what they need, what your levels are. Um, but if you don't get to everything every day, don't beat yourself up over it. For God's oh. sake, there are some days when, oh my God, I've only gotten to two. All right, we do this next time. You know, give yourself some slack. Be kind to yourself and your students. Whatever works, works. And you know, you're the only one who knows what's best for your class. So, Jill. Jill, do you gradually add comprehension too, or is that something that you do, like just easier comprehension to start? Yeah, so as a first year star teacher or first two year star teacher, um, it's gonna be a lot of prep for you. It's gonna be a lot of work. If you only get to the first two, that's perfect. Um, because then once you introduce it, like Joni said, they're gonna be at a higher level on the comprehension from teaching. Um, my students I've had with me for a while, so I do all three, um, but it wasn't an easy path to get there. Um, it's a lot of prep. It's a lot of work in the very beginning. Now it works. I mean, it's like, it's great. So they know what to expect. They know what to do. They know what, you know, strategies we're working on. Um, so it's, yeah, you can start with the, with the two. Um, if your students are advanced or if you have the extra time, you can do the three. But eventually you will do, be doing three, three components. And please, once you start teaching comprehension, don't race them through the different strategies. One strategy at a time, make sure they've gotten it and it's going to take them a long yeah. time. I couldn't believe it the first time, you know, in the back of your mind, like what's taking them so long, you know, it's hard summarizing is hard getting the gist is hard these are not easy things you're teaching them or even and, like they said today yeah. my student they were like oh i know all these words these are so easy and then they were like oh my god these are so hard and i'm like i know so yeah you really and, take your time please go slow and use all of those resources in the toolkit yeah don't I mean, it's going to probably take you three times the time you think it's going to take. So, you know, you're always going to over prepare, which is great. All right. You've got, <laughs> you move it on to the next class, but, um, and do group work as much as you can. Um, don't push them off individually. Assuming, well, I taught this to them. They know this, go ahead, summarize. That'll just frustrate them. If you have a big enough class where you can put two together, three together, or you're doing it as a class, do that. You know, it takes a while until they're ready to do it on their own. Uh, I, I, what I love about the strategies, especially the summarizing and getting to just is probably my favorite strategy is I was able to show them how to use it when they're doing the high sets, you know, that they can take notes and they can, you know, it can make them get through it faster. So mm -hmm. once they learn it, they have it and it's a great tool for them. And one person did ask about integrating the writing into it. So yep. and Joni had said, you know, the short sentences, the fill-ins, um, the completing the sentence. When they take the GED test, that's, a, that's gonna, the questions are gonna look like that. Um, you know, being able to write about a vocabulary word, about a science topic or a social studies topic, because they're not writing an essay. Um, so it's a good time to um, teach them, you know, for the future for their, their GED test alone. I think that's a good um, way to get that in there as well. I think. I'm through all the questions. What questions do you have? Oh, there you go. I have um, a question about um, folks with uh, uh, cognitive disabilities who might land in our adult education programs and who could potentially fall in probably the lower range of this. Have you worked with students in that? And um, I mean, is it appropriate? Well, what level? Well, I, I, we, we probably have students with cognitive disabilities in our class who probably are at that fourth grade level, maybe fourth, fourth and a half, um, 4.5. And so I'm just, my curiosity is, you know, have you worked with students with 
cognitive learning disabilities or cognitive disabilities and how do they respond to STAR and can they succeed? I guess that's my question. I have inadvertently, I mean, you know, then I will find out later that, oh God, yeah, this person has this, you know, we never get their full stories. And um, I will get through, a, you know, a few months and realize, hmm, something's going on here. It's harder, it's slower, but as I said before, there's something about STAR, if you take your time um, that, you know, unless you have a separate class for them, unless you have a reading teacher, unless you have, you know, which I don't know about everyone else, I've never had that. I could never say, oh, you're having this, you better go to Miss, you know, or Mr. Mm -hmm. So I've had to deal with it in my class. And the only thing that has worked, I mean, they enjoy the class and they enjoy being with people and working in groups. They're obviously on the lower end of it. And I have tried to work with them you know, if they could stay after class, if they could come in earlier, I've tried to work with them as well. If you have a volunteer, give them extra things to do. Um, but STAR isn't specifically geared toward that. So okay. Jill, what about you? Yeah, I think, yeah. you know, what, jo what Joni said, yeah, it could take them a little bit longer, you know, to catch on to the strategies and to feel comfortable with them before you move them on. But I mean, if they're in the right level, then give it a go. Do you have extra help? With the, probably not, right? <laughs> I, I, I'm really just anticipating. Mm -hmm. And we're, talk, we're talking about initially recruiting from our existing population, and maybe some of our former students who we know were stuck. Mm -hmm. So when I think about all of this, the, the individuals with cognitive disabilities who come into our program fall into those categories. So I'm mostly curious. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Can I just ask a follow up to, to Jill? Um, because I know when um, Jane in the in the star training has been stressing that you know you do whatever group of words you have and do it for the week mm -hmm. and to finish and which is what I was doing one four times a week, an hour and a half. But we, I don't know if you were both was saying, do you not stress it being a week? You just, however, like maybe- it Oh yeah, it's been weeks, weeks for five words. Just, okay, okay. So okay. I would not stress about that at all. Yeah. Yeah, don't, that's, that's, don't stress about anything. Okay. Yeah, it's just <laughs> like trying to, like we have to, like they want us to do the module and then write a lesson and then reflect on it and da, da, da. And it's just kind of like, okay, how does this all practically work? So that's good to know. What also, the other good thing about vocabulary is you should never just do one group of words and forget about it. Keep right. reviewing okay. them, you know, like, like we always, I actually have my own classroom, you know, finally, which is amazing. So I have a word wall. So now all the words go up and, you know, I'll suddenly say, hey, who remembers what this word is? Who remembers what that word was? And, you know, and I'm always trying to use them as well. So, but. Don't stress it. I mean, of course, they have to get you through the course. And yeah, yeah. right now you might have to, but um, and then you know, once you pass the training or you get through the training, um, because you know, there's going to be a snowstorm and there's going to be this and there's going to be absences and then COVID and COVID's you know, going to happen. Yeah. yeah. No, I <sighs> I work with the students at their needs. I meet them where they are, and and if they need a little extra time to get through the five words, then we take a little time. Yes. Any other questions? So I'd like to send you my book list. Um, so we'll get all of your emails on a page. I'm sure Joan can can do that. Um, and any helpful hints that we that I come up with, I can definitely share um, with you guys. Uh, you know, as I'm going through things, you know, there's always, you know, a form or a sheet or a cheat sheet that we have. Um, I'd love to share with you. And I'm always open for emails or questions. Um, no problems there. So, um, you know, we no, did, when I started, you. it was kind of in the beginning of STAR in Massachusetts. So I had Joni and I had Mary Lee, but there, there wasn't a, a group of people that would ever, that offered to help or, you know, so um, like, I wish I had known some of the things that I know now. So I'd like to share what I can with you, make, you know, help you be a successful STAR teacher. And there are tons of resources on that site, like Jill said. I mean, books, they have, look look under, under each module, 
they give you resources. And so they list books that you can use. Um, when we first started, we basically were desperate and we just asked anyone and everyone. And, and um, we would say for each successive, if you found a book, let us know. If you found a book, let us know. You know, we're gonna add it to the list. So um, this new, you should know that this new um, site that you're on is so much better than the old one. Uh, than the old star site and it has so many more resources and it's it seems to be very user friendly to me I, mm -hmm. I think it's really a good site yeah <laughs> and Carrie's like ah, why Carrie what's going on well I've had a lot of like technical problems with it oh, you know yeah. like when I try yeah. to write my answers and then it like oh, gives me oh, an yeah. error and then but I mean as far as like usability to find the resources I think that's pretty great but like right. the site would you itself, believe the first site had no search engine there was no way to look for anything. Yeah, I can't even. I had, we, we went nuts. We were like. <laughs> Carrie, we've had the same problem. We've had um, participants have to type things out and email them to us personally yeah. because yeah. they can't get into. And then the editing, forget about it. Like, oh, yeah. No, you know, I can't. The yeah. wall. The Let's wall not talk about text. it. So yeah, I can't. Yeah. Even, I, I'm like, whatever. But what I do is I just write everything up in a Google Doc now and I copy and paste it because I'm not willing to lose my work anymore. Right. That's what, that's it. Yeah. That's what yeah. we've been telling our participants. Harry, the first year that Jill and Yvonne and Merrily taught this, they hadn't fully coded and designed it. So we were teaching it and decoding uh -huh. and finding bugs all year long at the well, same God time. God love you. Like yeah, Merrily we said, it was like flying a plane without the wings. It's like, yeah. uh. so. so, so it sounds like we've benefited from the fact that they've had to do it all virtually. <laughs> Yep. Oh, you have no idea. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We were the pilots and we, um, we were the guinea pigs. We, yeah, we were. Um, <laughs> but now it's so strong. And I think, you know, besides the modules and that those bumps in the roads, I think um, we have a strong team and we have um, some good strategies going and some good resources. And right. um, I love it. I, I have one, like maybe, I don't know really a question, but maybe like, Maybe it is like I like to use shorts. I like to use short stories with my students star regardless. Right. I, and we're just now starting to start. Right. But like with my students, I typically like to use short stories from like authors that might be mentioned on the GED, like um, yeah. John Steinbeck or um, like, of, of course, all my favorite dead drunk romantics. You know, these are my <laughs> like all my very favorite. And, but I do think that they're kind of nice because you can get like, uh, you know, like a short story and it feels like a sense of completion. It's not yeah. too long. You can do it in one session, but I don't know. I have my like kind of favorites, but I wonder if you guys have like a collection of favorites of short stories like that. And then I even think about like, I did have Mice and Men with them where there's a book and a movie. So yeah. like um, these kinds of things, like, I don't know who, who's got- I have a collection of short stories. I have a whole file in my, uh, that work, you know? And so if I don't feel like doing the book, I, I bring up the short story. Again, I have to go look for my file now, but I had almost forgotten about it because I hadn't done it last year. And suddenly I'm like, oh my God, look at all these stories. I'd forgotten about this. One of my favorites is, oh my God, of course, now when you think about it, you can't, ah, darn it. I'll come up, send us everybody's emails and we'll just send um, you short, everything. Short stories, um, timed reading in, in literature might be mm. something that you'd like to look at. Um, and Star always suggests um, speeches. Oh, um, I love I, you speeches. Yeah, or, that's like yeah. Yeah. Well, you that, that's that, good you know, for the, fluency. Yeah, yeah we do the KFK speeches, and then we watch him, and it's just so powerful. Um, and I have a crush on him. You know the whole thing. on who? JFK Jr. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he's so cute. <laughs> My students would be like, "Oh, Miss Jill again." I'm like, "I know, he's so cute though." So, um, so Yes, we use um, speeches a lot as well. And those can be broken down and cut up as well. Um, and you know, you, you're you probably gonna get George Washington, a speech from him on the high set or the GED. Um, so at least- Well, for fluency, they're perfect. MLK, for, uh, yeah. yeah, MLK. Yeah, speech. we always do a little MLK, but I always like, I mean, John Steinbeck's my favorite. So I always like, he's my yeah. JFK. Oh, wow. Favorite. I have, I haven't, yeah, I haven't heard that in a while. I used to love Steinbeck too. Yeah. Well. 
and yet, but he has also a lot of short books. So it can also like, even if we're just doing like a short story, we can go in, and sometimes I'll just do a chapter just because it's so good. Yeah, he's intense. Yeah. Oh, wow. Really meaty. But they um, can handle it. Okay. <laughs> but then they can apply it to like today's situations. Like what I think when it was like, you know, we're all going through like these times. And I would, I love that. I think it's chapter five in um, Grapes of Wrath. I think Grapes it's five. Wrath. I can't remember. But it's the one where the men are like on their haunches and they're like kind of talking with the guy and, like it's just like these kind of figurative works and they're and it's only one chapter but it can stand alone yeah and maybe yeah. get them interested in reading in general like for leisure because like they always say oh i don't really like to read but like it's not that they don't like to read they just haven't found the things they like to read about mm -hmm. well believe it or not some science fiction really works i've got an isaac oh. asimov story that kills them every time i like stories with twists that they don't see coming and they're all like <gasps> at the end you know, like richard Corey's my favorite poem to teach because they're all like he did what he did what you know Anything that grabs them. Um, that would be yeah. a really great resource. Is it like just people like even like we had a Google Doc of just like what are your favorite ones to share with them? Because like I have my collection, but like mine's very specific to me, right? And I do like the Isaac Asimov too. My boyfriend, I can't remember what the name of that story was, but it was really great. Oh, the Martian Chronicles kills them every time. It's like, um, or there's a yeah. story where this poor uh, woman, a kid is never, who's waiting for the sun to come out. And, you know, they lock her in the closet. That one, the oh, rain. God. Oh my God, they, they end up crying in my class. They didn't let her see the sun. So I funny. love making them cry. Anything. <laughs> That's terrible. Yeah, my favorite thing is when they go, <gasps> didn't see that coming. What's the story, the one where they stone her at the end? Oh my God. Uh. Oh my what God. are you teaching these people? Yeah. Jeez, oh, right? brilliant I mean, story. Stop the recording. Stop the recording. No, just kidding. It's the lottery. <laughs> the lottery. Lottery, <laughs> right, right. Early Jackson. A yeah, that's my favorite author. Unbelievable. Such it's a by Shirley brilliant... Jackson. Shirley Jackson, Shirley Jackson, the lottery. You've never read. Oh my God. I'm it's writing it down. Normal, normal, oh, normal, it's normal until the last paragraph. And then you're like, what the hell? unbelievable <laughs> all right any more questions for us i'm gonna write that down too <laughs> yeah, there's there's down. definitely a lack of passion about what you all enjoy here i can tell yeah. <laughs> so would you but would you that's what makes guess, it fun <laughs> like for fluency collaborative oral reading i thought it was great when i did it is it just great to continue that or have you yes yes, yes yes yeah. <laughs> Okay, I, I kind of felt that from-, from We used standpoint. to have a trainer, Elaine. Do you remember Elaine? I remember oh, Elaine, yeah. oh, she trained me. Oh my God, yeah. I trained, used to train. oh, she, collaborative oral reading for her was the Bible. She said that that helped more of her students and got them more interested in reading and the passion because there where you can get the passion and the stuff you love and, and get them to really get it, you know? Well, um, also like, I think with the collaborative oral reading of, in your groups, it kind of builds your team in the classroom and they start to, mm -hmm. you know, besides just the reading and that's, you know, the teaching is what we do, but you know, building up, um, you know, some, com some camaraderie in the classroom yeah. as, as well and some confidence is huge, so. Yeah. And trust, I felt like it's a big trust. trust. Yeah. Yeah. Trust the other yeah. people in their group. Like I had a new student, his, his name is Juan and he started, he's the only boy in the class and um, mm. he's very nervous around all these women as he should be. <laughs> but, you know, he said, he said yesterday, you know, um, we were doing prompts and he said, um, I don't want to go yet. And I was like, it's okay. It's your first, you know, first time doing it. And Erlene, who's been with me for three years, she's like, oh, shut up Juan, and just start re come on. You we're all on the same page here. We don't judge anybody. Come on, just give it a try. And he did. And everybody was like, he was like, I'm not going anywhere else. Cause he was going to move downtown to another program. He's like, I'm staying here. Oh. Yeah, these are my girls. These oh. are my girls. And <laughs> You know, that's, to me, that was the best part of my day was, you know, like oh, yeah. Erlene telling Juan to shut up. I was like, this is great. <laughs> it <laughs> is. It's, so it's well. such a trust, you know, where they suddenly realize, oh, everybody's reading, you know, not so, oh, it's not just me, yeah. you know. And, and like, you tell them. Three years. I've been here for three years, uh, you know. And you tell them one sentence, just one sentence. That's all we're asking, you know, and you build up and that's it. I know my students really felt like they had made progress in this mm -hmm. four week, four times a week class that, you know, they really felt better. And mine are ESL students too, but they really mm. felt more confident and yeah. it was great. It was fun. The moment when they finished the book, 
Yeah. We get to that last page and close the book and we all just sit there for a minute. You know, it's like, it's quiet and we're like, <sighs> and we usually have some sort of celebration, you know, I'll know I'll finish. So I'll bring in cake or cookies or something like that. And everybody's like, <gasps> we did it. We finished the book. You know, it was like, yeah. it's, yeah, you, that's why you teach, you know, you don't make the big bucks. So that's right. <laughs> you don't. No, just Definitely not. I know. I've yet to make a living yeah. wage. Oh, are we still recording? <laughs> um, so Joan you'll send you can send us a list and I can get my books out because I love what I have back at, in the oh, office um, I'm dying to hear what you have to have to I have I, mean, I, I can too. definitely share um, a list of everyone that was um, who's in star you know in star but because uh, it may be a few other people who aren't on the call but you know yeah. I'll include them as well um, you know, if you're willing to share, I'm sure everybody's uh, willing pictures. to share back. So yeah, I'll take some pictures of the books that I use um, with some titles, and um, yeah, we'll I'll Thank get you, you some information. Yeah, absolutely. and Jill, do you find that it's really important make a whole different level if they get to keep the book, or is it okay just sharing a book, um, just having a book and giving it back? Do you yeah, they don't mind. I mean, sometimes they ask if it's if we have to stop at a good part of the book. Um, what I did with my advisor is at the door on the way out, we started our own little library um, of books that I don't read that I've read. And um, so they the other day, they, they all took a book with them. Um, but we're also on a campus, like a very small campus um, for um, and they, there's a library there. So we do a trip to the library um, as well, like a big field trip to the library across the street. So um, they don't need, I don't feel like personally, they need to take the book with them. Um, at the end, if they finish the book, would I let them keep it and tell my boss that I lost them? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but you want to um, know, um, see, I've always, and you know, I've, I, I understand where you're coming, but for me and my students, the ability to know that they're going to have that book at the end was like, um, and they're not expensive. I'm never going to order expensive books. So, um, and I just get it in the budget somehow, you know, that's. What's the book where, cause I, I won't sleep tonight without thinking about it. <laughs> cause it's driving me bananas. What's the book where the girl, they get picked um, and then they have to go fight. And if they, if they don't, and if they like don't the Hunger games. games. Yeah, the Hunger Games. Oh, the Hunger Games, yeah. Yeah, that's Yo, one of the that, books that, that I read with my one. higher level and they absolutely loved it. Yeah. I think that's um, like a seven, eight. Uh, I'd have to double, it was lower than I, than I thought it would be, but I guess like as we were going through, um, it was- A lot of young adult fiction is-, is Yeah, they is loved the, it. And then stuff. I saw yeah. that they went and got the next one and then- uh, we didn't watch it in class because, you know, we were virtual a lot. Um, but yeah, that was a good one. That was a good book. Yeah. The House on Mango Street, Sandra yeah, Cisneros. They love that. Um, oh, God. All right, I have to jump off because I have a meeting. Oh, go. Yeah. A go very ahead. exciting meeting at 12. So um, I'm closing on <laughs> a house. Thank you for your time. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. You guys yeah, were awesome. Um and I hope to be in touch with you soon. If you need anything, my email is on here. Um, feel free to reach out. Yeah, I'm going to put it yeah. in the chat. I guess. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. If you yeah, if you can put if you can put it in the chat yeah. too, that works as well. Yeah. But yeah, I have everyone, and just thank you both, Jill and Johnny, yeah. for yeah. joining because yeah, this is a, a lively discussion. So uh, we could go on all day. If, I if, have a feeling that's true. <laughs> Only if we had the time, right? <laughs> So, but thank you both. I really appreciate thank it. So. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having and, us. Anytime. And for everyone who joined today, because I know for at least one person, this is day off. So I appreciate you being here because that matters. So that's all about everybody. our passion for our students, right? So that's it. Anyway, thank you, everyone. All I'm right. going to stop our video. So all right. thanks, guys. Just Take care. Thank you, guys. <laughs> thanks, Joan, for organizing this. Yeah, thanks, Joan. Um, you are welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.